Well, howdy, hey, how's everyone doing? Oh, that's great. I, I didn't. You want to hear a youth pastor trick? It's a really cool trick. How's everyone doing today? Oh, that was so much better. Uh, just to let you know, I do have a little bit of a cold. Uh, with the nature of a cold for a Chris, that is me, my voice will either squeak sometime during the message. I may burp accidentally sometime during the message too. For some reason, that's just, that's what my body does. I, I can't explain it. That's how God knitted me together. But whenever I have a cold, that happens. Or every now and then, my voice just might stop like that. It might stop working. But anyways, welcome to Youth Sunday. I love my church. No, it's my shirt. I love my church for a lot of reasons because we intentionally and consistently take one Sunday uh, every few so months and we celebrate the gifts and the talents that God has given to our young people. Talk about empowerment. And, and today, we as a church, we, we get to hear message and talk about how we as a church are to function. And so when, when I think about Youth Sunday and the consistency that we do, man, that, that's just so cool. I mean, especially as a youth pastor, one that's empowering for me and that's empowering for our students. It, it just tells me a lot that we as a local body know how to function. And so for that, I want to say, you know, thank you. Thank you so much. Well, here's a fun fact about me. A lot of you may not realize this about me, but <coughs> I have two hands a right hand and a left hand. Uh, one arm has tattoos and the other arm doesn't. One arm has a wedding band and the other doesn't. I know it's a shocker for a lot of you that you see me up here with two hands. Now, of my two hands, I am dominantly right-handed. So I write with my right-handed. I shoot with my right hand. I play drums with my right hand. I do a lot of things with my right hand. The point is, I need my right hand. If I didn't have it, I wouldn't be able to function very well. I remember one time when I was in middle school, <coughs> my buddy Andy and I, we were at this youth retreat, and like any middle school pew peasant boy, we had this great idea on how to impress some girls. And so we thought, let's play tag, because what, what's more impressing than seeing two young squirrely boys run about and show off their speed and athleticism whenever their bodies are still growing so you're prone to trip on your own feet consistently? Anyways, so we started playing tag, and we thought, we thought we were really wise. We thought we were impressing all these girls because what's more impressive than how fast you can run from your friend? And so I tagged Andy. I started to run away from Andy. And I decided I'm going to take this a step further and go to the main lodge and be really, really cool for these girls. And so I go to the porch as I'm running for Andy, and I decide to show off my jumping ability. And so I go to the edge of the porch, and I come to the railing, and I jump off, high jump. Not really high jump. It wasn't athletic, but I thought it looked really cool. I jumped off the porch, and little did I know the section I was jumping off wasn't the section I thought I was jumping off. Because here's the deal. At, on this porch, you have a railing, and then you have ground where it's only two feet, you know, down or so. And then you have further down the railing, you have a railing, you have a porch, and then you have a lot more drop off and boulders about this big. <laughs> That's the part I jumped off of. <laughs> and so I jumped off the porch and I landed on these rocks and I rolled down the rocky hill and I broke my arm. <laughs> and so I'm there trying not to cry but my plan still worked because the girls felt bad for me. Now, it was, either, it was either one of two things. The girls genuinely felt bad or they thought, Secor, you're an idiot. Now, I'm going to go with the former. But either way, my running ability, my jumping ability, and my breaking of bones ability <coughs> impressed these ladies. Um, and so I was in a sling for a while. I wore a pink cast. It was really, really cool. And I couldn't do anything as well. I remember in class one day going up to the pencil sharpener and I put the pencil in. I'm just, I'm not getting anywhere. And so an another girl ended up helping me. I know I, I make myself sound like I was a stud in middle school, 
I really wasn't a stud in middle school by any means. I think people just felt really bad for me. <laughs> so they just wanted to step in and help. But overall, my overall capacity to function was degraded. And I know, I know this is a rather silly story, but really anyone who has broken a limb or has experienced a broken bone or of infection of some type realizes how, you know, how limited you are. Or, or maybe more seriously, we know how hard it is to function whenever we are experiencing financial loss or financial degrade, right? We have this lifestyle that we are accustomed to, and then all of a sudden, we're hit with this huge financial burden, a you know, loss of a job or a pay decrease, and all of a sudden, you find yourself going, whoa, I can't function anymore. I remember when my dad was unemployed for 15 months, and it was a, it was a genuine fear that we were going to lose a house. And I mean, we were accustomed to this three-level home and the reality of talking about we might have to move into an apartment. And I remember as a little boy, my experience with apartments, there's an apartment complex near our neighborhood that burned down every two or three years. And this isn't to degrade apartments because I lived in them for a long time. But my idea of apartment was scary because I didn't want lose my home first to financial loss, but now the possibility, I might lose my home to fire. I was real scary. Talk about experiencing dysfunction. Or maybe recently, I don't know, maybe some of you have experienced a divorce or separation from a loved one or, or separation from, from a child. Talk about utter dysfunction. And life, man, life just, life hits you. And the loss can really decommission us, right, church? Whenever we are in the moment of a crisis, in the midst of a crisis, that's heavy stuff. Now, if you were to sit in one of our large group teachings for, for youth group, you would constantly hear me iterate, <coughs> excuse me, you would constantly hear me iterate about grace. Here's a fun fact about Alliance Church. This may come as a shocker to some of you, but it's the truth, it's the reality of things. We, as a local church, are made of a people who have spiritually inefficient DNA. We as a local body, every single one of us, has spiritually inefficient DNA. And so when you throw that into the mix, church family, whoo, we need a lot of grace, right? We need tons of grace. Because when we are experiencing a crisis of some sort, rather by our own hand or someone else's hand, we as church members... Okay, we as church members, as, as a local body, get to function together and extend grace to one another or have the opportunity to receive grace from one another. You hear what I'm saying? You know, we have spiritually inefficient DNA, and because of that, we need Jesus. And so now we have the opportunity to extend grace because Jesus has given us grace, and we also have the opportunity to receive grace because Jesus is continuously giving you grace. Now, our Bible, God's Word, is full of stories and examples of people who have given grace, who have received grace, and also who have chosen not to receive grace or extend grace. Now, one story in particular is found in Acts. Now, Acts is in the New Testament right after the book of John. And Acts is a great book. Like, if, if you love history, this is a good book for you to check out, especially on the history of the early church, right? If you want to read about how, how did the church get from Jerusalem to, well, where it is today? Well, this is a great book to read on. If you want to read about this dude who, who used to persecute people, then all of a sudden became the most uh, champion of, of the church, this is a great book for you to check out. So if you have a Bible or a Bible app, turn with me to Acts 19. Now, in Acts 19, Paul is in Ephesus, right? You can almost compare Ephesus to, to Minneapolis or, or Chicago, if you may. Maybe Chicago is a little bit better, right? It's a central port. Everyone comes to Ephesus because Ephesus is a big city that's based on industry and opportunities and a lot of trade. And within Ephesus, there is this harbor. And so when you have a harbor and you have a bunch of shipping routes, both on foot and by sea, you almost have this environment where you can call it a melting pot, where a bunch of people come together and a bunch of ideas, religions, lifestyles, all of a sudden are intermixed. And because of this, because of the context that Ephesus was in, magic, not like pulling bunnies out of the hat, but light, dark magic was big here in Ephesus, okay? And so with that demonic practice, was also big. Now, the god of choice for the Ephesians was Artemis. Artemis is the god of fertility. And so we read in Acts 19 some of the problems that this local church and just 
just the context in general that, that Paul and other people and other Christ followers encountered. This is from Acts 19.16. All right, so then the man with the evil spirit leaped on them, overpowered them, and attacked them with such violence that they fled from the house naked and battered. Okay, can you imagine in Little Falls hearing a story about someone getting so beat up, just so physically abused that they left the house naked and battered? I mean, we, we would be almost, what? That, that doesn't happen here. And in Ephesus, with, with practice of magic, I mean, you could almost dare say, oh, that, that's not surprising. Last week, someone was just telling me about the future. Demonic possession was happening. And uh, there was a lot of spiritual and efficient DNA taking place. Then we read further on of this huge revival, which is good, church. You know, it's not bad taking place. But it's from this revival that we learned of some of the other practices that people participated in. Check this out. This is Acts 19, 18 through 19. Many who became believers confessed their sinful practices. A number of them who had been practicing sorcery brought about their incantation books and burned them at a public bonfire. The value of the books was several million dollars. All right, so from those two verses, you know, we're reading a lot of people are practicing sorcery or are practicing witchcraft. So you can imagine this was an area of just complete spiritual darkness. This was an area full of people with spiritually inefficient DNA. And we have to understand something here, church. Paul was in, was in this environment for over two years. Now, if I was totally honest with you, I could not imagine myself in a context like this. I, I couldn't imagine being in an environment where, where people are practicing uh, magic, worshiping demons. I mean, does it take place? Well, yeah, it, it does take place still. But so obvious, man, mad props to Paul and, and the early church there that got started. And I think we sometimes read scripture and overlook, you know, overlook that two-year statement. Because from that two-year statement, you can really guess that a lot of patience and a lot of grace had to be used by Paul. This required Paul to function in sync with the Holy Spirit. And so I want to ask you, church, are you functioning in sync with the Spirit? You know, that's, that's a simple question, but really it's a loaded question. Are you at the hip with Christ's Spirit? You know, when you go to work and you work with that one employee that you just, you're just super annoyed of, are, are you in sync with the Spirit to give that person grace, to give that person's patience? Or maybe you're at home and you're having an argument with your children or with your uh, spouse. I mean, is the Holy Spirit at your hip just guiding you, empowering you through that process? During Paul's time here, people are beginning to turn from their sins and become Christ followers, which is awesome. And we read that people burn magic books. I mean, that's... That's pretty insane. That's pretty intense. So, you know, they stopped practicing witchcraft. People were healed from the diseases, and people were free from demonic possession. And it's important to know that since people were turning away from sorcery and the practice of worshiping false gods, there was going to be a huge financial hit in the region, in the region right? So the burning of those books alone, that was a financial loss, equivalent to about 2 to $4 million. Could you imagine if we held a bonfire out here and burned 2 to $4 million worth of books? Would a lot of people be upset? I think so. Anyone's paycheck who was about to get smaller now in this area was not pleased with what Christ was doing, is not pleased with what Paul is doing, the fact that people are turning from their sins, are turning from, from demonic practice, from sorcery, and are now turning to Yahweh, are now turning to Jesus. Anyone whose pocketbook is about to get smaller is really angry, you can say. And this especially hit the blacksmiths hard in Ephesus, since their income, their profits came from constructing and selling shrines, specifically shrines of Artemis, the god of fertility, to the Ephesians. In fact, these blacksmiths were so upset, were so angry that they initiated a riot. Check this out. At this, their anger boiled, and they began shouting, greatest Artemis of the Ephesians. Further on, we read in verse 32, inside the people were all shouting, some one thing and some another, 
Everything was in confusion. In fact, most of them didn't even know why they were there. That's really interesting to read that, you know, a couple blacksmiths, you know, a couple blue collar workers started this riot. I mean, that takes a lot. You know, I, I remember when the riots happened in Vancouver and they lost that hockey. Do you guys remember that? Anyways, but a couple blacksmiths start this riot and then they get a bunch of people to join them and a bunch of people are shouting random things. Hillary, Trump, uh, Ephesians, Artemis. You know, just a bunch of random stuff. They don't even know what they're, are, what they're doing there. Yet you have a bunch of people who are angry. And that's, that's the interesting thing about anger, church. It's contagious, right? I mean, you know, someone could be upset about you know, the, the presidential campaign or whatever. And then next thing you know, Joe Buck over here is upset that he didn't get his Mountain Dew with, with nuts in it. You know, it it doesn't make sense, right? I mean, you read here and and talk about dysfunction because people aren't even on the same page. People don't even know what how these riots started or or what these riots are specifically on. And the reason I share this passage, the reason I share this story from Acts, is because this further exemplifies our spiritually inefficient DNA. This further exemplifies our need for Jesus Christ. You know, a big reason I love scripture. It's because scripture is still relevant today as it was then, as it is now. Riots are happening. Are riots happening today? Yeah, absolutely. Are are people angry over the most randomest things then, like they are today? Yeah. We need Jesus, church. So Paul writes this in the book of Ephesians. (coughs) Excuse me. And don't sin. (coughs) Sorry about that. And don't sin by letting anger control you. Don't let the sun go down while you are still angry. Hold on, I got to pause real quick. I sound like Batman. Where are they? Has anyone seen Batman? No? All right, anyways. I'm going to read that verse. Wow. (coughs) I got water. I'm good. Rachel. Where's the Joker? Anyways. And don't sin by letting anger control you. Don't let the sun go down while you're still angry. Ephesians 4, 26. Okay, here's another reason I really love scripture. Paul is quoting from the Psalms here to the Ephesians, to the Ephesus church. That's pretty cool. So this is what it says here in the Psalms. Don't sin by letting anger control you. Think about it overnight and remain silent. That's some pretty practical advice, church. Like, even if you are not a Christ follower, even if you are still going, yeah, Scripture's not relevant, man, I really challenge you because regardless of where you are in in terms of the cross, you know, don't sin by letting anger control you. Okay, well, don't do anything stupid by letting anger control you. Think about what you're going to do overnight and just just be quiet. That's pretty good advice still. You see... uh, Oh, sorry. And it's after Paul quotes the Psalms in Ephesians that he says this. If you are a thief, quit stealing. Instead, use your hands for good hard work, then give generously to others in need. That's Ephesians 4, 28. So you see, if the blacksmiths would have chosen to become Christ followers, they still could have made a profit by using their hands to build something that edifies, that celebrates the church. Instead, they chose to get angry. They start this riot and they choose to follow a false god. And what they chose, though, ultimately there was consequences. Riots, I mean, at the root of this riot, there's a lot of violence. Is it possible that maybe some of their shops got destroyed? It's possible. Is it possible Main Street of Ephesus was somewhat uh, defecated? That's possible. And, And what I love here... You know, what, what Paul is teaching about using our hands for good, hard work and giving generously to others in need, what I love here, man, church, it just requires us to take a step back and just go, man, who am I to, to complain? Like, who am I to even question or be angry about this? You know, because at the end of the day, it's just about Jesus. I mean, we, we, we see... You know, like in Job, Job is 
questioning all these things. And then all of a sudden, this huge storm comes in and God tells Job, hey, who are you, man? You know, were you there when I created everything? Uh Uh-uh. Were you there when I made the animals? Nope. So who are you to question? You know, church, you know, what, what, who are we to question? (laughs) Who are we to question God and what he wills and what he pleases? And what I see for application in regards to using our hands for good hard work and giving generously to others, in regards to, to not sinning and not letting anger control us, I see three things of application for us. Are you ready? This is going to be a huge shocker for you because no one has ever heard this before. Like, this is profound. I'm, I'm going to write a book after this. I kid you not. All right, here are the three things. Pray on it. Receive counsel. Sleep on it. I know. You've never heard this before. But this complements so well what Paul is saying in using our hands to not steal, but to give. It requires us to be patient. It requires us to be teachable. It requires us to lean into Jesus. Right, when, when Christ called his followers, you know, he simply iterated, Follow me. Come follow me. Right? He, he, didn't, he didn't tell them to, you know, follow me, and then you're going to do this and this and this, and I'm going to make you an entrepreneur. No, if anything, call, God calls us to follow him. He doesn't call for leaders. He calls for followers. You know, and as followers of Jesus We need that patience. We need that grace. We need to be teachable because church, there are so many people, you know, who aren't teachable and because they're not teachable, they miss out on what Holy Spirit has to give to them. They miss out on the opportunity of using the hands that God gave them to empower their communities, to make the name of Jesus famous and to celebrate Jesus with these things that we call hands. And while you may not be practicing witchcraft or sorcery, you know, such as the, efficient, the Ephesians, you know, we all still have spiritually inefficient DNA. The application for functioning members is simple. Pray on it, receive counsel, and sleep on it. Now, I want to ask you, church, how many of you approach God right away when you have a problem or a crisis. You know, this morning I woke up and my voice was just horsey. It was just, just raspy. And you know what the first thing I did? I went to my phone and I searched Google how to communicate with a raspy voice. <laughs> and I thought about this and I thought about my hands and were my hands giving generously to the church? Were my hands praising back to Jesus. You know, I'm not saying looking on Google is a bad thing, but my initial reaction wasn't to turn to Jesus. My reaction was to turn to Google. Talk about spiritually inefficient DNA. And I'm a pastor. (laughs) But that just blows my mind. The second question I want to ask, how many of you seek counsel for someone who has a gift of discernment. I could think, when I first got married, all right, fun fact. When I first got married, I was 19 years old, and my wife, Paige, was 20 years old. Okay, so I was a teenager, (laughs) and when you get married as a teenager, you have a teenage mindset, okay? So, you know, early morning, Saturday morning, you're still in your jammies watching the Power Rangers. I'm just kidding, that didn't really happen. (laughs) But... The point is, page is 20, I was 19. When you have a teenage mindset, when you have an early 20s mindset, you want to have fun. I mean, you want to go out and hang out with your friends late at night. And so I remember that first year or two of marriage, Paige and I would just argue all the time because we both had this, this early teenage or early 20-something mindset where we just wanted to hang out with friends. You know, something innocent, something not wrong but we are putting others before our own marriage. And we all know, as the years go by, we learn that's not a good thing to do. (laughs) Right, guys? And so I remember 
And by remember, I mean looking back now, thinking, man, if I just approached someone that had the gift of discernment, I could have saved, you know, both Paige and I a lot of hurtful words. We, we could have not been upset or yelling at each other. Instead, we could have just been having fun together. Because, you know, I mean, here's the deal. We're both 19 and 20. We still could have done stuff together late night. Yeah, even though we had a different circle of friends, we still could have done stuff together with our friends. You know, as Chris and Paige with Joe and Alex or Chris and Paige with Ella. You know, but for some reason, we thought we had to do it separately. The, the point of making church is, you know, whenever we're in a crisis, whenever we're in an issue, man, it is so wise to approach someone with a gift of discernment who can look into your life and go, hey, I, I see what you're doing, but here's how I recommend you should do it or how you can navigate through this process or through these waters. And I look back at that and, and I just think, man, I wish I did that. And what's even worse, I still had mentors that were investing into me, but yet I didn't, I didn't turn around and go into them and say, what am I doing wrong? You know, I, I'm, I'm 19 and I'm still hanging out with friends, but my wife and I are arguing. Oh yeah, okay, I, you're right. I should invest more into my wife. The point is, Man, seek someone with discernment because that is going to enable you. That is going to empower you and encourage you. And the last question I want to ask, how many of you sleep on it before you make that financial or that big decision? You know, I, again, you get married when you're 19 or 20. Man, this is making me sound bad. <laughs> you get married when you're 19 or 20, you just want to go, go, go. You don't want to sleep on it. But how much could have been saved if you slept on it? You know, maybe, you know, maybe for, for some of us who have gone through a divorce or are in the process of that, you know, what could have been saved if we just slept on it? If we just took a step back and go, you know what? I, I need to calm down. I need to pray to Jesus. I need to seek someone with discernment. I just need to sleep on it because these hands right now are not building the church. These hands are not functioning properly. These hands are dysfunctioning. Jesus, forgive me. You know, I, I think we all can relate to a time when we didn't pray over a problem or, or seek counsel or sleep on it. Because when I look out into this congregation, to this body of believers, I see multiple generations and from that, I see multiple stories of successes and failures. And I see a multitude of faces at the end of the day that need to rely on Jesus. I know I certainly have. And I know I certainly need to rely on Jesus. Functioning members are proactive. Paul lays it out here that we need to use our hands, our minds, our willpower to edify the local church. There's a reason Paul teaches not to let the sun go down when you are angry with someone. Because if you are angry with someone, church, if you are in dysfunction with someone, then how can you give generously? How can you use your hands to edify? How can you use your hands to build and proclaim the name of Jesus? How can you function? This is a heart check, congregation. What is the nature of your heart? Are you relying on Jesus or are you relying on yourself? You know, our, our mission statement or our direction statement here at Alliance Church <coughs> is coming together and following Christ. In order for that statement to be true, in order for that statement to, to come true, let alone, we all need to be functioning. We all need to be 100% all in. We all need to be walking the same way in hip, in sync with the spirit. Man, church, we all need to be in 100% reliance on Jesus. That's it. It's simple as that. So I want to call the youth band back up. And we are going to sing Undignified again. And I want to encourage us, church. You know, I, I know this song is repetitive. And there, there's somewhat of a groove to it. And it's a fun song. But there's a reason the youth band picked this song. There's a reason we want to sing this song for you guys. Because this is an opportunity to come together and celebrate what Jesus did. Because all of us have spiritually inefficient DNA. And so thank God for Jesus Christ. Because we get to celebrate his death and his resurrection. Because from his death, from his resurrection, births this thing called grace. 
And so when we are singing this song, you know, it's, it's pretty upbeat, it's pretty happy, it's kind of one of these things like, woo, celebrate the fact that you have grace, that Jesus is in you, and that despite our spiritually inefficient DNA, his grace renews your DNA and enables us to function as a church, as a local body. Christ conquered it all through his death and through his resurrection. And because of that, we have the freedom to not let our anger, to not let sin consume us and control us. We have the freedom to use these hands, to give generously to others and to edify the church as functioning members. And if we did that on a regular basis, church, do you think more and more people from Little Falls would come to know Jesus personally? I mean, seriously, think about it. If we use these hands, and, I, and don't get me wrong, we are an anomaly, I believe. And the fact that we are so involved and so invested within our community, that is rare and that is something worth celebrating. But if we continue doing that, if we continue wearing these shirts, if we continue helping people in Coburn's, if we continue glorifying Jesus' name, even when your coworker is annoying you, do you think more people from Little Falls will recognize that the man that feeds these hands is Jesus Christ? I think they would. And I think more and more people will come to know Jesus as a personal Lord and Savior. It would not be rooted in tradition, but would be rooted in relationship. That's the role of the church. That is one of the roles of the church. We are functioning members. We have spiritually inefficient DNA, but because of Jesus Christ, his wounds heal us. And that is a cause for celebration, church. Youth man, can you guys come up? Let's sing, church family.
So, so church family, use these hands. Build the church. Build God's kingdom. Church family, you are dismissed. Thank you.